Hello and welcome again to another session of 5 Minutes of Cardio Time. When I was recently thinking about possible topics to present in this format, I, I came across the question, what measurements are really essential when you assess a mitral valve case? And don't get me wrong, I am I love academic stuff, but what I'm doing in everyday practice is not like a, a, academic stuff. I have to be very practical. I'm dealing with a huge caseload every day and have been doing this for the past 20 years. So I had to filter out what questions, what, what measurements are really essential in order to provide the owner with the correct answers. And the correct answers are always about prognosis and therapy, right? So there's something that is generally accepted. It's generally accepted when you're dealing with mitral of cases, you have, of course, to measure left atrial and left ventricular dimensions. This is not the question. But is there anything else that might be of, of high interest in, interest in terms of prognosis? Yes, there is something. There is something called E and A waves. Maybe you heard about this before, um, but I can only emphasize that if, you, if you're dealing with, with a lot of mitral valve cases, start, start doing this, try it, and you will find out that it's really useful in everyday practice. Talking about diastole, what is diastole? Diastole is not a is is not is 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 um is not a single thing. It's it's a, a phase in the cardiac cycle consisting of of two episodes. The first thing is early diastolic filling. Early diastolic filling directly follows left ventricular outflow after a very short time period when all valves are closed. This short um, time period is called isovolumetric relaxation time. So once mitral mitre valve opens, early diastolic filling starts. And this diastolic filling um, is, is, um, uh, is accomplished by relaxation of the ventricle. But the relaxation of the ventricle is not something passive is an active and energy consuming process so everybody would think relaxation is something like you're yeah, going back to the globoid form um just a passive thing no it's not a passive thing it's something that needs energy and oxygen so if there is no energy and oxygen there's troubles with relaxation so early diastolic filling is is the first um part of diastole the second part following the P wave on the ECG, so following electric activation of the atria is atrial contraction. So once the atrium contracts, it also pushes a certain amount of blood into the ventricle. Okay. And this diastolic, um, the second diastolic part, atrial contraction depends largely on the volume of blood, of course, and ventricular compliance. So if you look at mitral inflow uh, by means of echocardiography, we can use Doppler for it. Mitral inflow means blood is flowing from the atrium into the left ventricle. And as you know, the Doppler beam has always to be aligned with blood flow. So the optimal view to get to measure mitral inflow is, of course, an apical view. An apical view where the cardiac apex is directly located below the transducer. And the left atrium is up here. Here you can see the mitral valves. And you need a PW Doppler for this because we are just interested in a local flow direction and velocity at the level of the mitral valve tips. So what you're actually doing is you place your sample, uh, your sample volume in between the opened mitral valve leaflets. Yeah? And then you get this double flow pattern here. Yeah? What you need as well is an ECG because you had to see the P wave. Because the P wave separates the E and the A wave. The E wave is early diastolic filling, the active relaxation of the left ventricle, A wave uh, reflects atrial contraction. Uh, so this is the E wave, that is the A wave. So it's basically not very difficult to get. It's very important to know that you cannot 
distinguish these two waves at heart rates exceeding 180 per minute. So if you recognize a very high heart rate in an animal, it's not worth the time trying to get an optimal mitral valve inflow. Because these overlapping E and A waves here, the heart rate of 227 cannot be interpreted. It does not make sense. And you need a sinus rhythm. So once you are dealing with atrial fibrillation or let's see an AV block rate three, mitral valve inflow doesn't make much sense. As you might know, many patients have something called the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. That means respiration changes heart rate. Heart rate increases during inspiration and decreases during expiration. This can sometimes change the velocities of E and A waves by a certain extent, but is not that bad. Yeah. So why would we measure mitral inflow in patients with the general mitral valve disease? It helps determining the patient's risk. It helps you to find out the likelihood of the actual presence of congestive heart failure, especially if it's difficult to obtain radiographs, maybe you don't have an x-ray machine at your practice. Yeah? And it helps monitoring the progression of the disease. So there is something that you can easily follow up in a specific patient. So here is another image of E and A waves in a patient. Here's the A wave. There is the P wave on the ECG and the A wave on mitral inflow. Early diastolic filling usually has an amplitude of 0.6 to 1 meter per second. Atrial contraction usually has um, an amplitude of 0.4 to 0.7 meters per second. And what is, um, what is important that the E to A ratio is usually 1 to 2. That means the E wave is usually taller than the A wave, but not taller than twice the A wave. Okay. What are the influencing factors for mitral valve inflow? It's left atrial pressure. It's the filling volume of the left ventricles or larger um, uh, volume overload will, of course, affect mitral valve inflow and relaxation and compliance of the left ventricle. In this specific case, the E wave is here, the A wave is there, and there's the P wave in between. So the E to A ratio is less than one because the E wave is smaller than the A wave. This is a so-called impaired relaxation pattern because it takes longer for the left ventricle to relax and to fill with blood. Okay, this is called the first degree of diastolic dysfunction, and you will observe it in many animals beyond 10 years of age and can be considered normal in these individuals. Okay, this is something completely different, even though you'll find a comparable pattern here. Yeah, this is also an E wave, that's an A wave, E wave and A, A, and A wave with P wave in between here. The E wave is smaller than the A wave, but they are confluent and the amplitude of the E wave is, is extre extremely high at about two meters per second. This profile is very typical of mitral valve stenosis. Yeah, I mean, in this case, yeah, if you just look at the mitral valve, you can easily see this mitral valve does not open up. So you would expect an abnormal pattern. Yeah, but this is the typical pattern of mitral valve stenosis. Okay. So we are not talking about mitral valve stenosis. Now we are talking about degenerative mitral valve disease. And in degenerative mitral valve disease, the taller the E wave is, the higher the filling pressure of the left ventricle is, the higher the risk of congestive heart failure is. Patients in congestive heart failure have usually an E wave higher than 1.4 meters per second. I would say in most cases, it's something like 1.6 to 2 meters per second. An E wave taller than one meter per second in a patient with degenerative mitral valve disease predicts progression of the disease very well. And if it exceeds 1.4, then it's a negative prognostic indicator in terms of the development of congestive heart failure. A tall E wave usually has to go along with a le large left atrium. 
yeah, because it needs a lot of volume overload, a progressed disease to develop a very tall and high E wave. But there's one exception. If you got a patient with a very acute coral rupture, that means let's say three or four chorda rupture at once, then you get a very high degree of mitral regurg at once, but the heart does not have a lot of time to enlarge because everything happens so quickly. You see, that means you've got a, a quite normal sized heart, a huge degree of, of MI and a very huge E wave. Yeah? So in these patients, the, the mitral valve inflow tells you more than the size of the left ventricle and the left atrium. So if you look at this patient, for instance, this is a patient with very advanced mitral valve disease. There's a huge left atrium here and a huge left ventricle. The PW Doppler sample volume is correctly placed here, and you see this giant E wave at a velocity of 1.8 meter per second. This is a consequence of a high left atrial pressure, a high filling volume, and maybe some myocardial failure as well. So these are examples. If you look at this, for instance, this is a dog with some degree of left ventricular volume overload and enlarged left atrium. And you can easily see that the E wave is something around 1.8 meters per second. That means it's quite uh, realistic that this patient is already suffering from congestive heart failure or this patient here. It's another one. See there is left ventricular volume overload and also left atrial enlargement, but the E wave is still below 1.4 meters per second means that this patient is quite unlikely to be in congestive heart failure right now. It's another patient. I think this was smaller one, not so easy to scan. There's also left ventricular volume overload. The septum is not straight and there is an enlarged left atrium. But the E wave is 0 0.86 meters per second. That means the filling pressure is not very high. So it's extremely unlikely that this patient is currently suffering from congestive heart failure, right? Or that one, I think this was a cavalier or so. Yeah? There's also left ventricular volume overload, left atrial enlargement, but the E wave is just 1.3 meters per second. So it's, uh, uh, it, it makes sense to monitor the patient, but it's very unlikely that the patient is currently in congestive heart failure. So summarizing. Mitral valve profiles provide a very valuable additional information. I mean, they do not replace a, a clinical exam, of course. Yeah, they don't. It, it, they do not replace a good two-dimensional imaging. Yeah, but they provide extra information. They can very be very easily included into everyday scans. I do it all the time and. And believe me, when I do an echo in a mitral valve patient, it takes me a couple of minutes to finish it. Yeah? It's not just academic. It's something that is really useful. You need an EKG, an EKG to differentiate E and A waves. So I would get one. It makes totally makes sense to have one. Yeah? Not only for E and A waves, also for the correct measurements of M modes. Yeah? It's not possible if the heart rate is higher than 180, or if the patient is an AFib, for instance, or has a, uh, a AV block grade three or something. There is sinus rhythm required. So if you've got a patient with respiratory sinus arrhythmia, the, then usually the amplitudes of the E-wave will vary over respiration yeah, in many cases. But honestly, most patients with respiratory sinus arrhythmia are not in heart failure, right? Yeah, because there's not much of a sympathetic activation. Yeah, But you can still use it. Maybe you have to average them. Mitral valve inflow profiles should always be part of every echo in the general mitral valve disease patients. It really makes sense, and I would really encourage you to do it. It really helps. It will make you a better sonographer if you're, doing, if you're sending out patients or uh, images for telemed, it helps a lot to those who are reading these images. Yeah, It will 
provide the patients and the owners with a better veterinary care. So many thanks for listening, and I wish you, wish you good luck training mitral of inflow profiles. Bye-bye.